Amen. You could go ahead and be seated this morning. Uh, you have your Bible. Um, turn with us to Romans chapter 6. We're going to be on the second half of that passage um, this morning as Paul asks another question about how we relate to sin as believers. Um, but to get the wheels turning, I want to ask you about uh, maybe if you can remember that, that glorious time in your life where you met coffee. Um, and I know there's some people in the room who are, you're like, coffee, that's not for me, and uh, you'll just have to bear with me. I, you can drink your green tea-infused antioxidant health drink all that you want, but coffee is what gets me going. And I can remember being in um, college, and we were having a conversation about coffee around the table one time, me and a, a group of friends, and one of the friends said something along the lines of, guys, I think coffee may be a drug, <laughs> And uh, I think there's probably some good evidence they could back that up with. Uh, but a wise, like, eighth-year senior that should have been gone, like, way before we ever got there, like, stood up or said, no, listen to me. Here's the difference between coffee and a drug. A drug is something that keeps you from doing what you're supposed to do. Coffee enables you to do what you're supposed to do. So that's the difference between coffee and drugs. And I thought about that, and I held on to it and put it in my pocket because then when I am drinking coffee, I don't feel so bad about, hey, this is helping me get done what I need to get done. I was thinking about that as I was reading this passage uh, this week to pray and prepare, and as I was thinking about how we as believers wrestle with sin and this idea of grace— this thought that Jesus' love for us has forgiven us of our sin, and yet we still struggle with the presence of sin in our lives. And here's Paul's question. He, he asks it because the reality is he knows this is going to come up in our hearts and our minds, those of us who are still in a battle with sin every day. What? Should we, should we keep on sinning because we're no longer under the law? We've been given grace, Paul. And, and, and doesn't that mean since we've been given, forgiven by Jesus of our sins that really we can keep on doing what we want to do anyway? And here's, here's the entire idea of what I want us to take away this morning right here is this, that, that grace is what enables us to obey, obey Jesus. It does not free us from the responsibility to obey Jesus. I want to say that one more time before we dive into this passage. Grace from God is what enables us to obey Jesus. It is not what frees us from the responsibility to obey Jesus. This morning, my message just has two parts. We're going to look at Paul's question, and then we're going to look at Paul's answer. So with that in mind, would you read with me, starting in verse 15 of Romans chapter 6, all the way to the end of the chapter there. Paul says this, What then? Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Verse 19, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you are slaves of sin, you are free in regard to righteousness." But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, bless the reading and preaching and teaching of your word today that we might see that your grace enables us to obey you with a new heart and doesn't free us from responsibility to seek after you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So I want us to see just two main things this morning. Uh, we're going to see Paul's question, and, and then we're going to see Paul's answer to his own question. And the, the question is phrased in verse 15, but it's pretty straightforward. Paul, can we keep on sinning because we, we don't have the law anymore? 
you've been following along in Romans, you know that Paul's talked a lot about what this idea of the law is and how the law can't really save us. It can only really make us more aware that we are sinful and how much we need God to intervene in our story and intervene in our life so that we can be made whole. And so Paul anticipates that some people are going to say, okay, well, if there's no law, if it's only grace, if it's only forgiveness, if it's only Jesus saying that we are made whole through his sacrifice— well, then what is really to keep me from continuing to do the things that I want to do anyway and then just continue to be asking Jesus for grace? And so Paul's question is basically, can we keep on sinning because we don't have a law? We don't have a, a Ten Commandments per se as believers in the New Testament. And, and what we mean by that is that there's no law that can save us or rescue us. We believe we're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, through grace alone. But I want us to see a couple of things about Paul's question. The first thing is that Paul knows that asking that question reveals a wrong perspective. A wrong perspective. That's an important word, perspective. You see, Paul knows that when we ask that question, is it okay for me to do what I want to do anyway because God's going to forgive me and give me my grace? Paul recognizes that our heart, before we even ask the question, isn't in the right place. Perspective is extremely important. Natalie and I went to the Braves game a few weeks ago, and um, from our perspective, I'll be honest with you, we had pretty good seats. We're sitting there. We're loving it. But from the angle that we're at, to me as a Braves fan, every pitch that a Braves player threw looked like a strike. I'll just be honest with you. It was hard from our angle, right? But so for me, if, if the Braves pitcher threw it, I'm ready to call it a strike. Now, interestingly enough, if a Nationals pitcher threw it, I felt like, hey, that's clearly a ball, right? That clearly wasn't a strike, but perspective is everything, right? If it's your job to call balls and strikes in a baseball game, where do you want to be? You want to be right behind the catcher. That's the best perspective to see the truth of if the ball coming for you is in the zone or not. I want to propose to you that oftentimes we begin to lose the battle with our sin before it even starts because we have the wrong perspective towards sin. We view sin and grace and the forgiveness of Jesus, not from God's perspective, but from our own. We view it from our heart of flesh that already wants to justify our own actions anyway. We, we look at our sin and it's easy for us to say, oh, that's okay. It's easy for us to justify, well, that, that little white lie was okay, or that, that little thought won't go too far. And so we begin to justify it. And the problem is initially that we're viewing sin from the perspective of someone who believes that all of their sin should be covered up and everybody else's sin should be the sin that gets punished, right? We want to call balls and strikes on everybody else. And, and, but from our perspective, we want what Paul's saying. We want to say, grace is this thing that covers me in such a way that I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, and not have to face the consequence, not deal with the reality. The problem with our perspective on sin in our human state is that we are often wrong about the weight and power of sin. What I mean by that is, is that we have a tendency to, to not think of sin as powerful, destructive, deadly, as a force that can overcome and overwhelm us. And instead, we think of it as just, as just actions that we tend to have that sometimes aren't what we wish they would be. And so what we do is we undercut the power and weight of sinfulness. And, and what I want to do is we zoom out just a little bit from Romans chapter 6. Even in this passage, we've already seen Paul say things like that you obey sin, which is, leads to death. And Paul has talked from chapter 1 all the way to where we are right now about the death and destruction that sin causes. That it's, it's not victimless, that our, our sinfulness is not some just poor choices. No, it's a heart of rebellion against a holy God, and it always leads to death and pain and destruction. The reality is that, that we have to understand, well, well, what do we need to rightly deal with the reality of sin in our lives? Well, we have to understand a perspective that's not our own. And the perspective that's not our own comes from understanding the gospel. We talked about this last week where Paul tells us in chapter 6, verse 11, that we have to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. And what that means is then we have to have a conversation with ourselves outside of our own uh, perspective and from the perspective of God who tells us, yes, your sin is serious. 
Sin is powerful, it's deadly, yet you are forgiven and you are now enabled to be dead to your sin and alive to God. So number one, the question already begins to reveal to us where our hearts are in the wrong place. Why? Because number one, we have a wrong perspective. And then number two, the question reveals we have the wrong motivation. We have the wrong motivation. You see, uh, the problem is not just that we ask that question because we're confused, right? Nobody who has this question probably genuinely would go to Paul and say, I don't know, you know, should I do this horrible, sinful thing that I know will, will lead to death and, and destruction and brokenness and hurt other people and hurt myself? And, and Paul knows that's not, not, that's not the motivation behind the question. And yet here it is, our motivation, rather than asking, how does my life exist to glorify God? Our motivation too often is, how can I get away with as much as I can get away with and still be okay? <laughs> We want to know, like, how far over the speed limit can we go before we're going to get a ticket? We want to know, like, how many little rules can I break before I have to face the consequences of my choices and my actions? And what does this do? It reveals to us a motivation out of our own self-comfort and self-preservation rather than a motivation to live a life for the glory of God. When we say, doesn't God's grace just have to cover my sin? And can I keep on doing the things that I want to do and enjoy doing because God has to forgive me anyway? You have to realize that that question itself demands that we think, well, what is the motivation for asking the question in the first point? And, and sadly, too often, our motivation is, how can I take the things that make me feel good about myself, like the forgiveness and grace of Jesus, and pair it with the things that make me feel good all the time, with the worldliness and the brokenness that we too often want to take part in. And, and we say, what's the line that I can feel good about my eternal salvation, that I'm going to heaven, and enjoy the things of the world that make me feel happy right here and now? Sadly, that, that, that's our culture's view of sinfulness. That's too often our culture's view of, of the way that, Christianity and faith works that that well we can just go to Jesus to forgive us and and he has to do it I heard a comedian who was not a Christian comedian but he was telling the story about going to a friend's funeral and saying something like his mom got up at the funeral and say I was, I'm, I'm okay because I know I know that that my son is with Jesus and the the comedian's joke is this he's like could you tell me when he met Jesus? Because I was with him on Saturday and he had not met Jesus on Saturday. When did this happen to him? And so what's the joke? The premise of the joke is that this is our culture's attitude towards sin. You can do whatever you want, live however you want to live, no matter how much brokenness it may bring to you and the people around you. And Jesus has to forgive you and can't hold you accountable for your sin. The reality is, is what Paul's saying is, if your motivation for coming to grace is to find a way to continue to live the way you want to live anyway, you have missed the heart of the gospel. You've missed the heart of what Jesus' sacrifice actually means and what it actually does in your life. You see, Jesus didn't die on the cross so that you could continue to walk in the very thing that's destroying you. Jesus died on the cross to free you and make you whole. So we have to understand that even in Paul's question, just in verse 15, he's getting at these underlying heart assumptions, the, the reality that, that even asking the question tells us that we have to check our perspective and check our motivations. So that's number one, the question. The second thing I want us to see is Paul's answer. Paul's answer, three words in the English, end of verse 15, by no means. Some English translations say, absolutely not. My, my modern paraphrase is stop it. Like you can't, you can't. You've misunderstood the gospel and you've misunderstood grace if your idea is that you should keep sinning because you've received the forgiveness of Jesus. Paul says, by no means, absolutely not. And he tells us the answer, why? Why can we not go on? Because the gospel has done something in us that transforms us. The gospel has done something in us when we truly believe in what Jesus has done and embrace what he says and who he is and identify ourselves with his death and burial and resurrection, then there's things that have taken place in our life that, that disqualify the idea that we can continue on in sin. 
So Paul uses three pictures. So I'm gonna give us three, I guess you could say sub points here about Paul's answer. And the first one is this, because of the gospel, sin doesn't own us. Because of the gospel, sin doesn't own us. Paul uses this picture of, of slavery and obedience. And this would have been something that would have been prevalent in the culture of the Romans. It was a culture of slavery. And we have to be careful because oftentimes in, in our, our understanding of slavery, we, we can misrepresent and misunderstand what the Bible's doing. Paul is not affirming that slavery is a good thing. In fact, you can read other places where Paul denies slavery being of God or from God. And, and we should, as believers, say slavery is absolutely wrong in the cases. But Paul says it is a picture that we understand because no man wants to be mastered by another man. No man wants to be under the bondage of someone that, that they have to obey and they have to listen to and they can't get outside of those parameters. So Paul uses this vivid picture for the culture around him, a culture that would have been built on the reality that most of the majority of people who were impoverished were in some sort of slavery, whether willingly or because they had been captured in warfare or born into slavery. They, the majority class of people who were not wealthy Roman citizens, would have been in some shape or form a servant or a slave to somewhere else. And so Paul says, think about it in these terms. Before you met Jesus, you were a slave to sin. Sin owned you. There was nothing you could do about it. Your flesh, because of your fallen nature, remember just a couple of weeks ago when we preached through the, the, the uh, covenant of Adam versus the covenant of Christ? When you're in that relationship of Adam, of fallen, broken, sinful flesh, you are enslaved to your sin. You are not going to get out of it on your own. And, and it's a slavery that just gets worse and worse and deeper and deeper and deeper. And there's nothing we can do by ourselves in, in our own humanity, in our own brokenness to free ourselves from the slavery of sin. We see this all around us. We see a world and a culture that we live in that's marked by addiction. And it's, it's marked by poor choices and brokenness and and really, it doesn't take very much at all to point out the reality that if you look around us, we live in a world enslaved to sin, enslaved to lust, enslaved to pride, enslaved to, to having to be the first and best, and, and enslaved to all of the things that we know deep down destroy us. The world that we walk in is enslaved to it. And yet, Paul says, Christian, because of the gospel, you who were once slave to a sin, look at verse 17, Paul says, thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Verse 18, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Paul says, we can't continue in sin because sin doesn't own us anymore. If you are in Christ, who you belong to has been transferred from the power and weight of sin to the power and beauty of Jesus Christ and to God our Father who loves us. Which means that we no longer have to submit to the demands of our sin. We no longer have to say, yes, I have to obey the sinful passions of my flesh. We are now freed, and, and as I said before, we're now enabled to say no to sin and yes to following Jesus. Paul says this is a reality for believers. This is a reality for Christians. He says, I'm thankful to God because this is true about us. Verse 18 is so, so important. Having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Two times, Paul uses this word, sanctification. Sanctification, our English um, translations use the word sanctification. And, and really what that word means is a setting apart a cleaning up. And so here's what we believe has happened in our lives as Christians. We have been, we use this big word justified. We've been justified before God because of the works of Jesus. And that's a full and final declaration from God. When you put your trust in Jesus, you are justified before the Lord and nothing can, can change that. But what Jesus calls us to then is a process and the New Testament talks about this process called sanctification. And in sanctification, what happens is that through the power of the Holy Spirit and God's means of grace, his word, his church, his people, confession to one another, prayer for one another, what God is doing is using all of our circumstances and all of our choices and all of our context to make us more like Jesus Christ. That's the process of sanctification. He is 
through whatever you're walking through right now, making you more like Jesus. And, and so Paul says the beauty of the gospel is that sin doesn't own us in, anymore. Instead, what owns us? Righteousness, which just means right living. We are now under the lordship of Jesus who wants us and calls us to live in a right relationship with God and in a right relationship with one another. We could talk about this for a long time, but I think the important thing to see here is that what Paul talks about is a change of heart. When you trust in the gospel, what happens is that your heart changes. Verse 17 again, that we've been, we were once slaves, but we've now become obedient. Where? From the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. What is Paul saying? Well, he's saying this. When you put your trust in Jesus, your heart's desire is no longer about your own glory and your own self-gratification. Your heart's desire is to live according to the standard of teaching. What, what does Paul mean when he says the standard of teaching? He's told us we're not saved by the law or works of the law or works of the flesh. Well, here's what he's talking about. The standard of teaching is life in accordance to the gospel of Jesus. The teaching that the people that have heard that Paul is talking about is this, that they have committed their lives to obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we can take rest this morning in the good news that because of the gospel, sin doesn't own us anymore. But that's not all. Paul says, wait, there's more. There's more good news. Paul says, because of the gospel, sin doesn't end us. Look with me at verse 20 and 21. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. I want that weight to sink in with us this morning. You see, apart from the work of Jesus in the gospel, the, the end point of our slavery to sin and the end point of our, our sinful flesh leading us is that we are ended by our sin. We, we like to think that we can get close to the fire and not get burned. We like to think that we can, like I said, how, how many miles over the speed limit can I go and, and not get caught? But the reality is that slavery to sin 100% of the time leads to death. We see this in Adam and Eve, right? Paul's already pointed us back to the creation story. But what does is, what is God tell Adam and Eve even before they sin? What's the consequence of your choice to go out on your own and do things your way? You'll die. You'll, you'll die in your brokenness. The more you choose to do your thing in direct rebellion to God's thing, one step closer you get to the end of your life. Now, we understand this in physical terms, right? There's sinful choices that get us closer to death, right? There's addictions that we can start with a seemingly innocent but sinful choice and get trapped into something that then physically leads us closer and closer to the breakdown of our own bodies and the stress and anxiety and, and all sorts of things. There's, there's literally sinful choices that lead to physical death, and yet... What Paul has in mind here, even deeper than that, is that the more enslaved you become to sin, the greater and closer you are to spiritual death, which is the ultimate end of, uh, of any hope of relationship with God. Sin is so serious because what it does is it separates our heart from our Creator's heart. It, it separates our, our ability to think the right way and our ability to love God and love others. What sin does is it leads to death. And Paul recognizes that even for the Romans, he says, what, what fruit were you getting from your sinful lifestyle? Paul says, I want you to consider, was the lifestyle that you were living making you happy? Was your sinful choices actually leading you to really enjoying life? Or was it that you were ashamed of your sinful choices. The reality is, and, and I think one good illustration of this is, is your teenage years. You, you think, oh, these people who do whatever they want, their life is so fun and it's so cool and they get to do whatever they want. And, 
my parents won't let me do that and I have to stay home and they can stay out as late as they want and they can watch whatever they want and be around whoever they want and drink whatever they want and do whatever they want all the time and it looks so much fun until you spend time with that person who is allowed to do whatever they want and be whoever they want to be at 17 years old and you spend time with them when they're 25 and you recognize they didn't win <laughs> at life. They weren't the person receiving the most love if, it, it was, if it's not for God's grace interceding in their life, they tend to be the most broken and sad people as adults that you can ever be around. And this is just one picture of the reality of what Paul's saying, that sin doesn't actually make us happy. We may appear on the outside to be the happiest person in the world, but let us get with ourselves and look in the mirror, and what will we find? What kind of fruit are we getting? That's a great question. Paul says, what fruit were you getting at the time? I was thinking about this yesterday because I went to my grandmother's house and my grandmother lives in the country, right? She lives in the country. And she told me my grandmother's the sweetest, most generous person. And she remembers things from when I was like four years old that I have long since forgotten. And she looks at me yesterday and she's like, Jared, I have some cantaloupe for you and I've already cut it and it's already in the fridge because I remember how much you love cantaloupe. And again, I'm like, I don't, I don't remember, you know, the last time I ate cantaloupe in front of my grandmother, but she gets it for me. And I'm going to tell you guys something. This cantaloupe was built different. It was the thickest, juiciest cantaloupe that I have ever seen. And I start eating it and it makes me like, at one time you're super happy. I'm super happy. I'm like, this is the best thing ever. And then you get sad because you're like, where did you get this? Like they're not selling cantaloupe like this where I shop for groceries. I've tried. I've tried, I've tried to get it from all the different grocery stores. You can't find it. And she says, you know, she says, there's just like this stand, right? There's a stand or a general store. Somebody's grown it locally and it's just different. And I thought about that. And I thought about the reality of as people, what we're looking for and what we get. I thought about the reality that we're looking for some fruit, right? And, and Paul uses this term importantly and intentionally, right? Because what do Adam and Eve do? They go to a fruit that won't sustain and it won't fill them up and it won't make them last forever. It breaks off their relationship with God. But what are we all looking for because of that consequence? We're looking for something that will make us whole. There's a reason that Jesus comes and talks about the fruit of our lives and, and the fruit that we produce and the fruit that we, that we take part in and the fruit that we want. And, and Jesus says, look, if you want the fruit, you have to ask, where's the connection to the source of the fruit? Jesus says to his disciples, I'm the vine and you're the branches. If, if you're cut off from me, you can't accomplish anything. You can't have any sort of fruit. And so what is Paul saying? He's saying, look, Distinct from the gospel, apart from the gospel, with the attitude that wants to continue in sin is this, you're cut off from any hope of having good fruit. Sin is, is like the, if you guys ever eaten dried fruit, I don't want to hate on dried fruit. But I want to say, if you've ever eaten dried cantaloupe and then you ate the cantaloupe that my grandmother had, you would know these two things can't be compared to one another. So often we look, even as believers, and it's our temptation to say, well, Jesus is going to forgive me, but I'm still going to go look to the fruit of the world to, to satisfy me. And Paul's saying, no, because of the gospel, sin doesn't in you. The, so, so, so then what is the fruit? That's the third thing. Number one, because of the gospel, sin doesn't own us. Number two, because of the gospel, sin doesn't end us. For we're told that now we, the end of our life in verse 22 is fruit that that you get leads to sanctification and its end is eternal life. So the third thing I want us to see is because of the gospel, sin doesn't pay us. Paul puts these two, these two ideas in front of us. He says, the wages of sin is death. That word wages is literally a term that means repayment or payment. So this was a term that everybody of their day would have understood one that you and I understand as well. You either get a check from where you work or you get direct deposit or, you know, maybe for our teenagers, mom and dad are kind of that direct deposit. Like you just, yeah. Um, but the reality is this, we understand payment for what we've done. We go to work for 40 hours a week. We want our job to pay us what we're owed. If we work hard, we want, we want what we feel like we deserve and we feel the value that we put forth should be paid back what we get. And, and Paul says, here's the reality Sin will enslave you, 
sin will kill you and sin will pay you what you owe, pay you what it owes you. And though we may feel like the, the outpouring of our sin is enjoyment and all these different things, Paul tells us clearly something that deep down we all know in verse 23, the wages of sin is death. But then here's the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel, the end of the very last verse is that sin doesn't get to pay us as Christians. And that's this, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The beauty of the gospel that Paul wants us to understand is that if we got what we deserved, we would get the wages of our sin. If we got what we deserved, we would get paid back for our sinful choices and our sinful patterns. But Paul says this is, this is the truth of the gospel. The free gift that Jesus gives us, not based on what we've done to earn it, not based on our good works, not based on our ability to keep the rules or our ability to check the list and do enough good works to outwear. No, 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 it's a free gift. It's one that we could never earn on our own. So I say all this and I get us to this point here. Most of us in the room this morning know, and, and praise guys, y'all can go ahead and get ready to come this morning. Most of us in this room, I believe, know the gospel. Most of us understand the truth that we've walked through in this passage, that we can't continue in sin. And yet, here's where we live. We live where what we know in our head often contradicts how we feel we have to act in our lives. And this is the, the, what Paul's going to get at in chapter 8, talking about the living in the spirit rather than the flesh. But here's where we live as Christians. We live in the presence of sin, but Paul tells us we're free from the power of sin. So what does that practically look like in our lives to understand? That, I, that until Jesus returns or calls me home, I'm always going to live in the presence of sin. And I'm always gonna live around the temptation of sin. And yet the promise of the gospel is that I no longer have to live under the power of sin. And so here's my practical takeaway for us this morning, and I said it in the beginning, is this, that we have to be able to understand and articulate grace and a grace that enables us to obey. Last week, we talked about Paul saying, consider, count to yourselves that you are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so my, my encouragement to us and challenge is this, to ask ourselves this, is my perspective and my motivation and the way I think about sin, is it lining up with God's definition of grace that enables me to obey Jesus? This is the, the root of, of where it gets. As long as, as long as our understanding of grace is just an intellectual idea that's far off, that Jesus is gonna forgive me someday and I'm gonna get to go to heaven, we'll find it really hard to struggle with sin where we are because the weight of our feelings and our temptations and what feels right in the moment can, can only be impacted when we understand how to articulate grace in our hearts and our souls. I wanna challenge every believer in the room this morning. There's three places you need to go where you need to have grace articulated to your heart. And the first place is you need to go to the Lord. You need to spend time meditating on the gospel and meditating on the grace of Jesus and asking yourself, in this temptation, in this circumstance, in this trial that I'm walking through, how would God articulate his grace to me to enable me to obey? The second place you need to go is to trusted brothers and sisters in Christ. We had this conversation in our small group last week that it's one thing to have internal dialogue but it's another thing to have other people who love you, who can articulate the grace of Jesus Christ to you when you need it. It's another thing to have people who are close enough that you can be two things, humble and honest, but also willing to listen to truth. When you have that in your life, it is a guardian against sin because you're able to hear not just from yourself, but from somebody else who's saying, have you thought about how the grace of Jesus enables you to deal with this situation? Have you thought about how the gospel doesn't free you to do whatever you want, but it actually gives you the strength and spiritual energy that you need to, to overcome this? And then the third thing is this, that we need one another. We need the, the community of believers where we can come and listen and sing and pray and have grace 
continually articulated to us in our lives. This week, I'll be honest with you, I have, um, in my role as a pastor and, and even just as a friend, I've, I've, I've encountered sin and that's part of the call of ministry. It's always there because we always live with the presence of sin, even though the power may not dominate us. But, but I'll be real with y'all this week, it, it's felt in a lot of situations and conversations that maybe the power of sin really is too much. And what I've been reminded about and, and what the Lord's worked and impressed on my heart and what I hope he'll impress in all of us is this, that, that, that we have been freed from slavery to sin. That's a truth. It's not a hypothetical. It's that we really can live in enabled grace that allows us to obey and overcome in trials and circumstances and situations. But, but I think about those three things, being able to articulate grace to yourselves, having trusted close people who can articulate grace to you, and then having a church where grace is articulated to you. And I recognize the reality of this, that we are gonna sin. And so, so here's what the gospel enables us to do. A, we never have to be shocked by our sin because the Bible tells us we're capable of it. But B, we never have to be shaken by sin either. We don't have to be shocked by it that, that we are capable of bad choices, but we don't have to be shaken by it that it's going to win because we know what Jesus has done, has overcome, he has freed us. So I'm just gonna leave us with verse 23 and then turn it over to the praise team. This is the promise to us this morning. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord, amen.